Hey folks, welcome to Dairy Technology Tuesdays. This is Kathy Barrett with Cornell's Pro Dairy Program and along with Cornell Cooperative Extension, really pleased to be able to offer you this webinar series. Today, we have Dr. Jeff Buley with uh, Holstein USA who will be talking to us about looking ahead, dairy technology of the future. So uh, Dr. Buley, I see you have your slides up and you're ready to go. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off to you. Okay, thank you, Kathy. Thanks for the invitation to present to your group today. I'm excited to be here talking about technologies. It's an area that I've spent a lot of the last couple of decades working in. And this is a hard topic to talk about dairy technology of the future because there's so much that's already here with us today. I'm going to talk to you about what is out there now, where some of the new technologies that you may not be as familiar with are, and then a little bit of an insight into what we can learn from some of the existing technologies and some of the existing technologies that didn't make it maybe on the market and then finish up with a little bit of a vision of, of where we're headed. I think that's hard to predict, but I have some thoughts about where we're headed in the area of technology. As Kathy mentioned, I work for Holstein Association USA on the analytics and analytics and innovation scientists there. And part of my role is overseeing what we call the WKU Smart Holstein Lab. So this is Holstein Association's effort to explore dairy technologies and how they fit into the dairy industry. It's at Western Kentucky University, and we have over 30 different technologies there on site with that herd, looking at a lot of different applications, developing new technologies, and trying to see how technologies work moving forward. So as I mentioned, I spent a lot of the last couple of decades working in dairy technologies. And I just want to start out by saying we've come a long way with dairy technology. And this is sort of my, when I was a kid, I walked uphill both ways to school slide, showing where we've been with dairy technologies. <clears throat> you can see four different pictures here. The one on the upper left is a picture of one of the first wearable technologies that was out in the industry called the ice cube. And this was a technology that I worked with very early in my career. It's interesting because at that point in time, you had to connect a serial cable to each of these devices to download the data. You had to work the sand out of the port with a toothpick, and it would take an hour to two hours to download all of that data onto your laptop or computer from each tag. And now all that data is transmitted wirelessly. In the middle, you see a picture of a raccoon. Uh, I show that because raccoons and rodents have been one of the biggest challenges that, that I've dealt with in dairy technologies. They're very talented at unplugging technologies, moving technologies, chewing through cables, et cetera. And it's just a reminder that no matter how advanced we get technologically, that we still have some practical realities that we have to consider. On the upper right is a picture of an image of a cow from above, and you can see 23 points on that animal. This is our first attempt at automated body condition scoring. This is from my PhD work. And just a reminder that it wasn't very automated at the time. At this point in time, we were, I was clicking on these 23 points on thousands of images, actually developed a callus on my hand from the mouse from this work during my PhD. And as we can see, that's not very automated. However, today, this process is very automated and we have multiple technologies on the market for automated body condition scoring. And on the, the bottom left is a picture uh, from some early work where we were looking at rumen temperature. We wanted to see what the impact of water intake was on rumen temperature, and continuously measuring temperatures. Unfortunately, with that particular technology, the only way it would read is to run the cows by these panels. And you can see here where we're pulling the cows through as we ran them through for about three hours 
and they didn't really want to run through after a while. Now, again, all that data is communicated wirelessly, and we don't have those challenges. We've come a long way with technology, but there's a, an exciting future ahead of us. And there are a number of industry trends that are really setting that stage. First of all, we have more margin challenges, and we continue to focus on improving our output efficiency while reducing our input cost. We recognize that there's a need for more individualized cow care and cow monitoring, particularly as we move toward larger dairy operations. We have higher demands for food quality, food safety, and increased documentation requirements on farms. Part of that's related to animal well-being. We're increasingly concerned about animal well-being and documenting the animal well-being on our farms. We have a need to make more timely decisions on farms. And of course, we also want to improve our environmental stewardship. All of these things are setting the stage for demand for increased use of technologies on farms. And we have a road that's paved with technology. The future is, is full of technology, providing us the opportunity to collect rapid and continuous measurements of dozens and dozens of variables on our farms every day. Some people have called this the second ring revolution. And I think that's probably appropriate given the, the movement that we're under and the improvements in efficiency that we have potential to gain through all of this technology. Maybe we might also think about, about it as a white revolution since we're talking specifically about dairy milk here. If we're able to detect disease earlier, we have potential to improve our treatment outcomes we can identify herd level problems faster and we become more proactive rather than reactive. I really think that analytics and how we use data on our dairy farms is the next scientific breakthrough. We've made tremendous advantages biologically, advances biologically. How we use data is our next big opportunity. I also think it's important to recognize that the dairy industry with big data, long before big data was cool, um, we've been using data in ways that other people have only dreamt of for many, many years through things like genetic evaluations, the DHI system, ration balancing, et cetera. So we have been doing this. We're just taking it to the next level. I really like this new slide that the group from IFCN and Progressive Dairy put together recently that shows a lot of the players involved in dairy farm technology. This is very new, only a couple of weeks old. And it's just amazing to me how the number of players in this area continues to grow. I've had a lot of fun going through some of these websites, learning about some of the new companies and new technologies that are out there. Um, you can see lots of players that have been involved in the industry for many, many years, but you also see some startups on the, this slide also. It's interesting that I had another slide that another group put out back in 2018 that I used for a while, and it's amazing how many of those companies are no longer around. That's an important part of what I want to talk about later is what can we learn from the companies that didn't necessarily make it. When we think about technologies, it would be remiss if we didn't talk about automated milking systems. They're changing the way that we milk cows. This is not new technology. The box systems now, that technology is 30 years old, but it continues to become more and more refined and closer to perfection. I think we'll see more of a movement toward automation on the rotary parlor whether that's full automation or partial automation, that will probably fit our larger dairies a bit better than some of the box-based systems. We also see automation occurring in herringbone or parallel parlors. There's a company out of Israel that's developing technologies for robotic milking in a parallel parlor. The automated calf feeding systems, which I know is a, a big part of as well, Costa's presentation have changed the way that we think about feeding calves and provided us with a lot of new sources of data there. There are a lot of neat things 
coming along in terms of automation of processes on a dairy farm. This is a system that we've been working with at the Smart Holstein Lab that I'm extremely impressed with. It's called the hoof count system. It's an automatic foot bath delivery system. Maybe not that fancy in terms of the data that's collected, but here we have a system that provides as the automation of something that oftentimes just doesn't get done on our dairy farms, delivering the foot bath solution, counting the number of cows so that it ex exchanges the foot bath between 200 or 300 cows or whatever your number of cow patches you would recommend for your particularly foot bath, with foot bath additive. Precision feeding continues to ad advance. We start with the idea of individual animal grain feeding. That idea is kind of coming back some, at least in robotic milking systems. The feed pusher systems now are commonplace and even getting to where now, as you can see in the video here, they're not just pushing feed, but they're also remixing or refreshing the feed as it's pushed up toward the cows. And then the next level is the automatic TMR mixing and delivery with systems like the Lely Vector. One of the most important types of technology that we can have on our dairy farms, which we maybe don't talk about enough, is feed management software. In my mind, it's the number two type of data we need on our farms behind dairy management software. Feed is our number one cost, and all of these systems can help us really refine the way we manage feed in our farms. This is an example of a technology that uses NIR technology on the feed bucket to measure the moisture content of our wet forages, our silages, and our halages so that it can do real-time dry matter adjustments. We're now using drones in some cases to measure the contour of a feed pile to give us our feed inventory. Feed inventory in, in the silage pile is often difficult to do because of the irregular shape, but this provides us with that opportunity to give us a really solid feed inventory through the use of drones. Here's another simple idea. This is a technology that uses a, a small device that sits on a feed bin that measures the amount of pressure on the feed leg to give us an indication of the amount of feed in a feed bin. And then that information is sent back to the feed supplier to create a feedback loop to avoid unnecessary or emergency amount of feed calls. There are new options coming in terms of manure management, essentially Roomba-like systems for picking up manure. This is again, increasingly important in automatic melting systems. In extensive, in extensive systems, we have technologies coming about now for basically providing virtual fencing in intensive pasture-based systems for rotating animals between pastures with a virtual fence. This is a technology that, that I'm very excited about. There are multiple technologies like this now. It's, this technology basically is a sensor that sits along the feed bunk to identify whether or not there are cows in a particular section of the feed bunk to give us the opportunity to only turn the soakers on when there's a cow in that section. And these technologies have been shown to reduce the amount of water used by soakers by 70%, which is hugely important because of this important limited resource, but also from a cow's perspective, it helps to keep the, the alleys drier, and then we don't have to remove as much water down the road into the lagoon and the uh, manure handling system. One type of technology or data that I also think we don't talk enough about is technology related to human resources. This is a very simple technology that's provided to dairy farms for monitoring people. It's basically a, an automated time clock. We can then use that information, tie it into what's happening on the farm so we know who was milking when, who was feeding when, who was breeding when, et cetera, so that we can tie in performance to the people and provide feedback there. There's systems now for 
automated uh, augmented reality. Um, the, the augmented reality system here is basically setting up where you can put these goggles on and you can see in the air, if you will, your cow cards or your information about individual animals uh, without having to hold a uh, tablet or a smartphone so that you can you can see this information in real time. Another system would be the uh, the idea of monitoring air quality within the barn. So this is a system called Sonomus out of Italy that's monitoring about 20 different air quality variables real time and continuously. This idea, I think this is the topic also in this webinar series of automating the barn monitoring and actually measuring micro environments when in the barn and providing feedback loops so that we turn fans and soakers and open curtains and so forth on based on the section of the barn, not just the entire barn. Here's another new innovation in technology. This is a company called ITK, the Farm Life Technology, where they're actually providing a heat resilience score so that we get an indication of how different animals respond to heat stress. And they also, they also um, will have an insurance program. So with this program, you can sign up for an insurance option so that you can, you can get paid if there's more heat stress in your area than what you might have expected to see based on the climate. Another idea is rethinking the way we house our, or manage our animals. And this is a new technology out of the Netherlands that I find kind of interesting. It's moving toward the idea of automating the manure removal from a loose housing system. So this system actually removes manure from the bedding automatically and provides us the opportunity to have cows in a loose housing system, not within a stall-based system. Really a, a neat idea. I don't know exactly how feasible this is or how well it works because it's a new concept, but I love seeing this kind of innovation. Another Dutch technology is the cow toilet. This cow toilet concept basically is looking at ammonia removal or re reducing the amount of ammonia that's released into the environment. Hydroponic feed production, I think, is going to become increasingly important, particularly in areas where water is a limited resource. And these technologies can provide up to 15, 20% of the dry matter needs for a lactating dairy cow. We could also look at automating the process of injections. So in this case, we have a technology that is automating injecting hormones, vaccinations, et cetera, in the exit alley of a barn. The area that, that really I spend most of my time in is what we call precision dairy monitoring. And this is where we're looking at variables within the milk behavioral variables, physiological or confirmation variables. And we're typically measuring these things across time and using a management by exception approach. So we're looking for the outliers. The best example of this is estrus detection, where we're looking for an outlier based on a change in activity. And we know what to do there. We know it's time to breed that animal. We could also look at something like rumination time or, or eating time for a drop in those variables to indicate that that animal is becoming sick. Estrus detection, as I mentioned, is the most mature of these technologies. Mastitis detection also uh, has been developed to some degree, probably less used at this point outside of the AMS systems. Fresh cow disease detection, lameness detection technologies now coming out, calving detection technologies. The other thing is all this data provides us with new phenotypes that we can use for genetic traits. And we can also extend that data beyond the individual cow to monitoring groups of animals or the herd of animals. I like to divide these technologies into three major categories, the wearables, the image or machine-based technologies, and the milk analysis technology. And there are dozens and dozens 
of each of these options for dairy farms on the market today. The wearable technology market is just an extension of what's happening in the human industry. We've taken and borrowed ideas from the human industry and brought those over to the dairy industry. That's why you often hear us talking about Fitbits for cows, and that's very much what we're doing with the accelerometer-based technologies. And we're looking at a number of these, continuing to develop these at the Smart Holstein Lab. You can see here the ones that we're working with to measure things like rumination time, activity, eating behavior, temperature, number of steps, and animal position. It's important to understand the base technology behind a lot of this movement. And that's the accelerometer. The accelerometer is indeed the same technology that's in a Fitbit. And this is what an accelerometer looks like. It's a fairly cheap piece of technology. You could actually go on to Amazon and buy an accelerometer for a dollar or two. So it's not an expensive technology because it's been so widely adopted in many other industries. And at first I thought this was really a crazy idea that we could measure something like rumination or eating behavior from an accelerometer on a cow's ear or her neck. But if you look at this cow ruminating, you can see it's a very consistent motion that's occurring as she's ruminating. And it's fairly easy through pattern recognition to pick up that rumination behavior with this technology. And then we can take that data and really get a time budget for what's going on with every animal in the herd. This is the NEDAP technology. We know what's happening in terms of when cows are lying down, when they're eating, and with their technology, it's a real-time location system. So we actually have a map of the barn indicating where cows are and when they spend, where they spend their time. Another opportunity that we have is for measuring behaviors that we might not have thought about measuring before. So one of the areas that I've thought a lot about is sleep. You see pictures of two different people here in two different sleeping scenarios. On the left, you have a gentleman sleeping in an airplane, perhaps not very comfortable, not getting as good quality of rest. And on the right, a gentleman that's very comfortable in a big, large bed. And what made me think about this is our observations in compost bedded pack farms. This is a system that, that I've worked with a lot. It's very common here in Kentucky, where you see cows like the cow on the left in a very deep REM type of sleep. And this moved us to thinking about rest quality, not just rest quantity. We've done a nice job thinking about lying behaviors and lying times over the last couple of decades. But the next horizon might be in getting into rest quality we can pick up these types of behaviors because we know how important biologically sleep is to us humans, and it also likely has an importance for dairy cows. And we can do that, as you can see on the picture of the cow on the upper right. She's got all the EEG, EKG equipment on. That's obviously not very practical, but we can take an accelerometer-based technology, like you see in the, in the bottom right, to measure this more practically. Probably the next horizon for thinking about how we can use wearable technologies is moving away from behavior and into physiology. So this is a, a new technology that's being proposed now where they are using an ear tag. The ear tag is looking at the interstitial fluid in the ear and measuring variables like progesterone, BUNs, BHBAs, NEFAs, cortisols, body temperature, and of course, includes an accelerometer to get that activity data also. Really excites me the idea that we will be moving away from a non-specific indicator through behavior to a very specific physiological indicator like progesterone. There's tons and tons of opportunities with calf data. I think we've only scratched the surface of this, and I know that Dr. Costa covered this in his. Another thing that we need to think about is not just monitoring cows, but monitoring equipment. So here's some examples of a technology from a company called the Melt Group where they're monitoring the equipment. They may be monitoring pulsators, vacuum levels, et cetera, automatically so that we can again be proactive with equipment 
just like we are with our cows. One of the questions that I get a lot is where's the best place to put a device on a cow? What are the pros and cons of different locations on the cow? To me, the ear, the advantage is it's very easy to put on. It's a small size. However, it can easily be caught and torn out. The leg stays on well. However, it's harder to put on and it may collect some manure. The neck is a great location for behavior. It stays on well, but we need to be considerate of neck growth. So first lactation cow, by the end of that lactation, we're probably going to have to adjust that strap or an animal that gains or loses a lot of body condition, we may have to adjust the strap. The tail is a great location for behavior. However, it's hard to get it on where it doesn't fall off. And if we get it on too tight, it may cut off the blood flow, which would then in turn stop the tail. The reticulo rumen is nice in a way because there's no exterior device and it can measure a lot of things simultaneously. The downside of that is we can't reuse the devices. We can use these technologies to develop cow responsive environments. So basically we listen to the cow, we listen to her being heat stressed and we do that through body temperature, lying time, eating time, and we use that information to determine when to turn our fans and soakers on, as opposed to just the current ambient temperature. There are a ton of future opportunities coming in machine vision. I'm really excited about the technologies that are coming out now for machine vision. The Cadillac company is developing technologies for looking at lameness behavior for a body condition. There's a system called One Cup that's developing technologies for monitoring a number of different behaviors. The BovaCare technology that's looking at developing technologies for calving behavior technology. And then again, we need to think about not just monitoring the cows, but monitoring people. So the cattle care company, they've developed this technology that's monitoring the people, monitoring the processes here, in milking, so it counts whether or not animals are dipped, the prep lag times, all the things that we would want to pick up if we were monitoring this in the old fashioned way, but it does it automatically on a large number of cows and a large number of milkers. Another kind of neat idea is using the muzzle print of a cow, the biometric data as her identification essentially like a fingerprint for a human. The Canthus technology is looking at using this same concept of machine vision for monitoring cow behavior. They're identifying whether or not cows are lying, standing, eating, et cetera, and tracking this across time to give us a time budget of the cows within the herd. And then they're also monitoring the feed bunk to indicate a change in the amount of feed across the bunk or in sections of the bunk to help us refine our feeding process. Sort of the next level of that technology is the idea of using a camera system for individual animal feed intake monitoring. So the Viking genetics system is, is looking at doing that primarily for feed efficiency research in genetic evaluation. And as we talked about early on, the concept of automated body condition scoring has advanced very well to where we have these systems now on the market. This is just an example of what we might do in terms of lameness detection, monitoring the movement of each leg or limb. We can track the leg, we can track the speed of movement, the differences between the left and the right rear, for example, in speed to identify when a cow is becoming lame or what leg she's becoming lame, leg, lame on. In addition to the machine vision, one of the huge areas of development is in milk monitoring. There's dozens and dozens of variables we can collect within the milk. The one that we gravitate to the most is somatic cell count because we're familiar with measuring that at least on a monthly basis. You can see here there are quite a few technologies now that are doing inline somatic cell count measurements. So we know the somatic cell counts of every animal, every melting. Of course, that provides some new challenges as far as what to do with that information. But nevertheless, 
very interesting to think about being able to monitor milk quality at this level of granularity. And then there's the idea of sort of this lab on a chip concept. So we can measure things biologically. There are dozens and dozens of biomarkers. Some of them we know of today. Some of them we probably don't even know what they are yet. And we can use that information also to look at biologically what's going on within the animal. So it might be measuring again, progesterone, DHBA, calcium, uh, indicators of stress or inflammation to be able to use the the milking parlor essentially as our laboratory as we're already collecting samples from each cow three times a day. There's another neat concept. It's a technology that's saying that they can take a bulk tank milk sample and identify the somatic cell count for each cow in the herd if that herd is genomic tested. So from one sample, to be able to get every animal's individual cell count based on the genetic signature of the somatic cells produced by each cow. Really, to me, a, a mind blowing concept to be able to get that level of granularity from a bulk tank sample. We can also extend the idea of somatic cell count to dividing that into the individual leukocytes. So the Q Scout technology divides the leukocytes or the somatic cells into macrophages, lymphocytes, and neutrophils to understand more where the animal is in dealing with an infection. Or we could take the idea of an on-farm PCR pathogen detection system with this technology called Acumen uh, to, to really hone in on what the cause of our mastitis is. Being employed by a hosting association, one of the important things for us in understanding data is understanding how we can use this information for genetic evaluations. And as you look around this slide, you see there's all kinds of new data that we're collecting that provide us with new phenotypic information. And that new phenotypic information could then allow us to create genetic evaluations for things that we only dreamt about doing before. Oh, there's lots of questions about how we use this data, how we uh, summarize it, how do we handle calibration and differences among technologies and so forth. But nevertheless, a very exciting potential application of technology. I've had a chance to work with a lot of technologies over the last 18 years, and some of them haven't made it to market. So what can we learn from the companies and the technologies that didn't make it. There's a large dairy technology graveyard, and I want to share with you some of the things that we've learned. One of those is that sometimes the technology has physical form problems. You can see here a, a technology that we worked with at one point that's no longer on the market that had a large device. It used eight B-sized batteries attached to this device that you attach to the cow's back. And believe it or not, it didn't stay on the cow's back very well, it irritated the cows. So it really didn't work very well just because of a physical form problem. We, if we're going to attach something on the animal, the animal has to be able to, to deal with that and not create an uncomfortable situation for the animal. Another issue is just that there's sometimes too much infrastructure needed for a technology. We have lots of cables and, and lots of, of hardware that, that's needed for some of these systems. And particularly on larger operations, this becomes really, really limiting with what we can do with the technology. Another thing that we see is, is a new name, same idea. So it, it's another Fitbit for a cow. It's another somatic cell count monitor. There's only so much room for competition in what, in the grand scheme of things, is a relatively small market. We saw this earlier in this session, but rural connectivity is still a limiting factor, and it becomes a limiting factor for a lot of technologies on farms. This is particularly the case if we're talking about machine vision data. We're talking about videoing cows 24 hours a day. The number of gigabytes or terabytes of information 
that's required to store that data, to transmit that data is very large. And that simply may not be possible in some rural areas. Unfortunately, a lot of times companies miscommunicate where they are in the development stage of the technology. They over promise and they under deliver what they have. And this puts a bad taste in everybody's mouth with technology. Also, I think particularly those of us that like technology, we can get too caught up in how cool or how neat the technology is and not focus enough on the information provided by that technology. The information is what's important, not the technology itself. And the other thing that we have to be aware of is that some data is interesting, but it's just not useful. It may be that it's cool to measure that, it's neat to measure that, but in the end, if we can't do something with that, then it's really not something we should spend money on on the dairy farm. And along those lines, some systems, although they provide us with very useful information, they're just too costly to justify the investment. Some of these systems are very expensive and the farm only has so many dollars that they can reinvest into the operation each year. We talk a lot about disease detection, but I think unfortunately, sometimes we get too focused on detection and not enough focused on the prevention of disease. So if I'm a farm, for example, that has 60% lameness, then I probably don't need a lanes detection technology. I probably need to work on the reasons why 60% of my cows are lame. We also tend to assume that if somebody says their technology measures X, that it actually measures X. And I can tell you from personal experience and validation studies that this is not always the case. We have a need for third party validation of these technologies. Somebody needs to validate that it does what it actually says that it's doing. And here's an example of why that is an issue. This was a study that we did a few years ago where we had multiple devices on the same animals. And you can see here three different technologies that were measuring rumination time. On average, there was over 100 minutes a day difference in rumination time, even though these were on the same cows. Four different technologies measuring line time. On average, there was over three hours a day difference and three different technologies measuring number of steps. And on average, there was over 2000 steps difference. Same cows. So these weren't measuring the same thing. We can tell you from validation studies that some of them were better than others. Um, maybe in the end, it's not important that they're different, but we sure have to be careful in comparing the results across farms when we have different technologies providing us different levels of these behaviors. And I know that, that Julio Giordano will touch on this in his presentation, but we have to keep in mind how good are we at finding the events of interest. This comes down to sensitivity and specificity the false positives, the false negatives, they provide a lot of frustration for the farm and making these technologies actually work and be useful on the farm. When we integrate data from multiple sensors, it is very likely that we can improve this sensitivity and specificity. However, there are some barriers to that because these technologies don't always talk to each other very well. Another challenge that we often have is, is what I call a data dump. We provide a lot of data to the farm with no interpretation of what that information means. One of our huge areas of limitation is the data silos that we have. We have lots of information about our dairy farms and our dairy cows, and it tends to sit in silos and doesn't communicate very well with each other. This is improving and improving rapidly. There are a number of different players now that are involved in developing systems for integrating data across multiple types of information. And I'm sure there's more that I haven't even included here. Now, it's not as easy as what I thought it was. 10 years ago, I thought this should be easy. 
because we can just merge by cow, merge by day, whatever the, the number is. It's much more complicated than that because it's not a technical limitation. It's a limitation of, of does somebody want to share the data? Uh, do these two companies want to work together, et cetera? So it's more of a business thing than it is a technical thing. And I think we'll, we'll continue to get better in how we integrate data, but it's never going to be perfect that we have one system that everybody uses for integrating data across different sources of, of information. With all this said, with the limits that we talked about, we need to recognize that perfection is the enemy of progress. Sometimes I hear discussion about, well, this doesn't do a good job of X, but it does so much more than what we were able to do without the technology that it's still a massive amount of progress. I think tomorrow's technological innovations are beyond what we can imagine, and we should dream big. What's going to happen is other industries are going to introduce new technologies that open new doors. We can't even imagine what some of these are today because the technology isn't going to develop, be developed for the dairy industry. It's going to be developed for the automobile industry or the manufacturing industry. And then somebody's going to come up with the idea of adopting that idea and bringing it into the dairy industry, just like with the accelerometer. That wasn't developed for the dairy industry, but we've been able to take that base technology and bring it into the dairy world very successfully. I think we're going to see a shift in the focus within the technologies. We're going to move a bit away from repro and health and more toward animal well-being and environmental sustainability. We're also going to see a shift from the wearables to more machine vision and milk analysis technologies. The nice thing about machine vision and milk analysis technology is we can take a fixed cost and spread it out or divide it out across multiple animals, as opposed to having a variable of cost that's attached to every animal. We'll continue to see a shift to focus on decision support, not just here's information, but how can that information improve decision making on our dairy farms? And it's already getting to this point where the machine learning algorithms or how that data is processed is more important than the technology itself. We will see better data integration. I think that creative farmers will figure out a way to use their data as a revenue stream. This data has a lot of value and can be a revenue stream in the future. There will continue to be more and more repeated tasks that are automated. So we see this already with milking and feeding and feed pushing, but more and more of these tasks will be automated as labor continues to become more and more of an issue on dairy farms. We'll see more technologies developed to monitor equipment and people, not just the cow. And the demand for quality data will increase. Dairy farmers continue to be more and more sophisticated about what they want out of their data. And the demand is going to be that it has to be good data, useful data that provides an economic return, not just data because it's interesting that I can do this on my farm. And lastly, I want to say that at all levels of the industry, whether that's on the farm, in industry, or in academia, People who understand data and cows will be in high demand. There are a lot of people that understand data. There are a lot of people that understand cows. But where those two intersect, the number of people that have a good understanding of data and a good understanding of cows is fairly limited. And those people are going to be in high demand as data becomes more and more important for our dairy farms. We will see more data-driven dairies. Data-driven dairies treat data as an asset. They understand some basic statistics. That doesn't mean they need to be a statistician. They manage with economically important KPIs. They look forward, not just backwards, and they connect production to finance. I always ask farms, who is your chief information officer? 
This is a role that will be a full-time role on large dairies and at least a part-time role on small dairies to make sure that we understand how to interpret and use all this information that's provided to us. And although we can get real tech, techy and real data focused in this area, we always need to keep in mind that this beautiful creature, the cow, is the center of everything that we do, and we should never lose sight of her. I hope that you've gotten some new insight into what's currently out there in dairy technologies and some ideas about what may be coming forward in dairy technologies. Thank you for your time. There's my contact information, and I encourage you to follow the Smart Holstein Lab on Facebook and Instagram, or check out our website if you want to see all of the technologies that we're working with there at the Smart Holstein Lab. Thanks again, and I know we already have quite a few questions here. Thank you for your time. Oh, thank you very much, Dr. Buehler. That was an excellent presentation. Greatly appreciate your taking the time to, to put that together for us and present it. So you're right, we do have several questions here. Um, and so we'll, we'll jump into those. But before we do that, I just wanted to um, just take a quick moment and um, thank the the, uh, the sponsors of our, our program um, who have uh, made it possible for us to be able to put this program on for um, at no cost. So I just wanted to really just quickly pull up the, uh, the list of the sponsors that we have here today. So Finger Lakes Dairy Services, um, uh, Perry Vet, Let's Feed in Oneonta, uh, Balcom Ruminant Products, uh, ASP Interiors, Bomatic, Feedworks USA, De Laval, Chibani, and Milk Group. So I just thought it was appropriate to give those folks some recognition because they enable us to do this program um, without any cost. So, um, with that, Camilla, I know that you've you're going through these um, these questions here. Um, maybe we could just go ahead and let you take it from here. Thank you, Kat, and thank you, Jeff. The presentation was great. We have some questions coming in, some people commenting, uh, thanking you for the great presentation. And the first comment we have uh, is Javier said, in a business with so little margins and high costs, it's almost impossible for a small and medium producer to have access to these technologies. Uh, so it's just a comment, but I am curious to see what you think about how you know different size herds can adopt technology. Uh, if there is like different technologies that you see being, you know, uh, uh, adopted by different sizes dairy, or if you think all technologies are for everyone and, you know, how, how do you see this coming in the future? Oh, first of all, I, I think that um, in general, we, we probably don't have that, that low margins in the dairy industry. We like to talk about low margins, but margins for the dairy industry are, are relatively high compared to other industries. It's return on assets where we tend to struggle. And, and because we have so many assets. And that that is really the base question that's being asked here. Um, I think, first of all, we need to recognize that, that a dairy farm has an investment portfolio that they're looking at at all times. They're looking at, at multiple things to invest in, not just technology. And so sometimes there's good reasons why people invest in other things first before technology. So the question to me, is what's the need and opportunity on the farm, not whether or not we should invest in a particular technology. And I do think that many of these technologies are very small farm friendly. Um, when we take something like an estrus detection system, the wearable technologies that are out there, it's, uh, it's, it's a variable cost system. So it doesn't cost a lot more for a small farm per cow to invest in that system than for a large farm. Now, if I have something that's very heavy fixed cost, so let's say I have one piece of equipment and it's a $100,000 piece of equipment, maybe I can't do that on a 50 cal dairy. Maybe it makes sense on a, on a 2,000 cal dairy, but not a 50 cal dairy. But I think we have to look at each individual technology and look for the technology that do fit the small farms. There are some out there, and I think it's a mistake for a small farm to say, no technology fit me because I'm small, because we might be putting ourselves at a competitive disadvantage there. Um, it has 
to be individual, but I see lots and lots of small farms, 50 cow farms, 200 cow farms, adopting technology very well. And in some cases, maybe even makes more sense for the small farm. So for example, the, the box-based automated milking systems really fit the small farm very well. Maybe there's cases where small farms are better, but it, it's very much dependent on the farm. Yes, I agree. Uh, I have another question kind of in the same direction that is saying like, I'm guessing you get asked it all the time by their farmers where they should start, given there are so many different technologies. How do you guide them? So it's a similar question, but how do, how do they narrow down their options and see what's better on what's fit their situation? Right. Well, again, to me, it's not about should I invest in the technology? It's if I have money to invest back in my operation, where are the needs or opportunities I have in my farm? So maybe, for example, uh, the example I use sometimes is if I have a lameness problem, maybe regrouping my concrete makes more sense than investing in technology. So we, we need to not look at technologies in a vacuum. They're, they're a piece of, of the investment portfolio. Um, as far as what should we invest in, uh, I like to think about it in terms of maturity. And if I'm putting things in order, herd management software is number one, feed management software is number two, and then I'm going to probably go toward the, the estrus and disease detection and behavior technologies today. The, those are pretty mature technologies. Now that may change in the future, and it also very much changes depending on the, the needs of the particular farm. If that farm, for example, does a wonderful job with reproductive synchronization and that works for them, they probably don't need an estrus detection system at this point in time. Um, but it has to be thought in the context of, of what issue do I have on my farm and can a technology help me with that rather than which technology should I invest in? In that same direction, someone asks about a uh, return of investment. Uh, so do you, do, you, do you think there is a, you know, a number or like a, what, what does the return of investment need to, you need to consider when uh, adopting a technology? Can include potential labor savings and value in this decision making as like you can, can you include these variables as part of like the return of investment? The, what the level of ROI depends on the level of risk aversion of the farm. Um, I think many people would say they'd want to see at least a three to one or a five to one return on the technology. Uh, labor savings is important. There's also some intangible benefits. So sometimes quality of life or what it allows us to do, quality of life for the farm or the cow that might justify some of the investments that we that we make, um, but no doubt that it has to provide an economic return. And we've done some work and other groups have done work looking at the investment of technologies and some of them don't make economic sense. Uh, and again, that, that's very herd specific, but very important to, to look at that. Yeah, in that same direction, uh, you talked during your presentation about, you know, how there is like a difference between sensibility and specificity for each like technology that is coming out. So do you do you see a need for like a standard to help with the introduction of some of this technology process? So like a consensus based, evidence informed, accredited standards. Like so, do you think it should have like a standardized process to like qualify these as like a technology that should be in the market, or there is something that already happened in that sense? I do think there is a need for standards of how to evaluate these technologies. Um, it's, it's not easy. Um, I'm, I'm part of ICAR. ICAR, the International Conference on, on Animal Recording, and there's a group there that's trying to work on developing some standards. Really important work, I think, but in the end, the farmer has to value that for it to be useful. And so, you know, it, it really needs to be farmer driven rather than, than, than research and academic or industry driven because it's, it's only important if it matters to the farmer. Um, and, and I do think we should be looking for certain sensitivity and specificity on detection technologies. And we should be looking at making sure the technology does measure what it says it's measuring. Um, 
that I'm not sure that farmers are asking that question. And, and that's that's probably the most important part. Okay. We, are, we have like a question about data ownership. So uh, what do you think about the, you know, data managed for all the different systems? You'll comment a little bit over it, like how integrating the, the data is, is kind of hard. And in with that, I just want to make a comment that uh, I had a farmer calling. I work here as an extension person. And I had a farmer calling that she, this person wants to, you know, adopt one, one technology, and, but she uses she doesn't use like a third party software. And because she wants to get this technology in order to use everything together, she would have to get like one more software. So, and, and in addition to, to this, as I understood based on your presentation, we would have to add one more thing that would be the data integration. So how do you see this going to the future if people have to pay all these extra fees for all the different softwares? And who, like who is the owner of the data and how do you see this data ownership going as we move forward with these new technologies coming? Data management is going to become more and more of an issue for, for farms. It's not unlike what we do in all other aspects of our, of our world. Um, there may be additional software that's needed, and then the farm has to look at that as whether or not that's an investment to, to make. Um, I think we're going to have more and more options for good data integration, but that has to provide a value in order, order for the farmer to invest in. Um, and again, it's, it's technically not that hard, but getting everybody to play together is, is not always easy. Um, as far as data ownership, very complex issue, and I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so I, I don't know all of the complexities of it. Um, in principle, we like to say that the data is owned by the farmer, and my personal ethic agrees with that, that I, I would like the idea that the farmer owns the data. Um, in reality, I don't think they always do, um, because they many in many cases they've signed it away and the example that I use is I have many apps on my on my phone and I don't read the end user license agreement as well because it's it's written in legal ease and and if I've decided I want to download an app for something I just scroll through and I say yes and in yeah. reality in many cases I've actually signed away ownership of the data and unfortunately I think farms do the same thing. They they have signed away ownership or co-ownership of the data, and maybe that data is being used in ways that they don't want it to be used, but they just, they've already bought the technology and it's an afterthought, and you look at a 10-page document and you just sign it. Um, and it, it's something that farmers need to be increasingly concerned about and to ask more questions about, about who owns the data. And some companies are very transparent to say, you own all of your data. And, and personally, I, I like that because they paid for it. But it's not always the case when you really get into the fine detail of, of the, the legal documents, unfortunately. So that's some, another thing that farmers should start kind of questioning so for it to change. Unfortunately, it's, it's an issue. I think we have some big legal battles coming forward. Um, and unfortunately, the challenge with that is is an individual farm doesn't always have the, the legal capacity or the capacity to hire the lawyer that a, a major company does. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, we have a question about that last thing you comment on about how we might be losing sight of the cow and how do you think consumers are gonna, gonna to perceive this, you know, in, the person that sent these comments call it like the industrialization of the cow, but like how are consumers going to perceive this, all this technology and maybe reducing this contact people cow and like, what do you think about this moving forward? I think that there's some, there's some valid concerns and, and valid questions there about um, what the consumer views things. Um, in many cases, I think the technology improves things from the, the way it was. So, for example, I can't watch a cow 24 hours a day. These technologies can help provide us with individual animal attention. When you get into things like automatic milking systems, then um, 
these cows have to live a more natural life. So there's some advantages there. The grooming brushes are a technology that has been touched on. They'll provide some benefits to cows. Feeding technologies that help us to um, make sure cows have feed or like there's a technology that identifies if the headlocks are locked too long. That's an advantage. So there are many cases where there can be very positive aspects, but um, I can understand, you know, a lot of people like that idea that, that animals are known by individuals and so forth. The reality is with or without technology, that, that's not always there. Um, but this is something that we have to grapple with as an industry. Some of us in communicating how we use technologies for improved animal care, but ultimately some people's ethics are their ethics and, and we can't really change that. Now we have like some other questions that are more specific of different technologies. So we have this question uh, asking, cattle care detects not only milkers and milking protocol deviations, but interaction between milkers and cows. Do you hear anything about their scoring system for such kind of interactions? Or maybe you know another company that try to measure these issues like aggression or inter bad interactions between people that work with cows and the cows? I do know a little bit about that. Um, and I do think that that technology has that ability to identify um, a negative interaction between a, a person and a, and a cow. Um, from my understanding, that, that data is kept very secure so that it doesn't get into the wrong hands. Um, on one hand, I think that's that's very positive because that negative interaction by an employee to a cow is, is unacceptable. Um, so if, if it helps us to identify those interactions so that we can deal with it, either by firing the employee or coaching the employee, um, I think that's very, very positive. Some people have some concerns about privacy and so forth, but the reality is, um, you know, I, I'm not sure how private we can be in some of this because uh, we have to take good care of our animals and animal abuse is, is unacceptable. Okay. Uh, I'm just just, just going to step back a little bit because I, I missed some of the comments that were added to the Q&A about the data ownership part that I didn't address because it was like in the bottom. So it, it was just a comment saying that farmers should strive to understand the data ownership question when they're considering any given technology because some companies will openly state the farmers own the data, others will retain. So again, uh, comments on how farmers should make sure they know what they're signing for before they buying the technology because, you know, in that way they will be informed in the future and know how to deal with the situation they they are. So I just wanted to comment it because it was a very good uh, comment about it. Uh, so another question, another, another technology is how accurate are you finding the real-time NIR dry matter tests at loader? How does it account for variability for within bucket dry matter? Great questions. I've not worked with that technology directly, so I don't know the answer to that. Uh, another question is, will the work of their nutritionists be fully automated and replaced by artificial intelligence in the future? I don't think so. I think there will be a lot of assistance provided by the technologies for nutritionists, but I don't think it will be fully automated. I think there's too much involved and a nutritionist is a nutritionist and most dairy farms is more than just a nutritionist. They're a consultant, they're an advisor. And, and I just don't see that role being replaced by artificial intelligence. I think it 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 falls into what you said about how people that understand data and cows are always going to be like necessary moving forward because if you don't have people to help you know kind of filtering the data and what to do with that it's it's not going to work so I, I I agree with you I don't think it's going to be fully fully changed like this uh, so the, the there is a question here saying you said wearables are out cameras are in are the camera and their business models to cost prohibitive for farmers, especially small ones at this time? So I may have misspoke there. I certainly didn't mean to say that wearables are out. I, I meant to say that there will be a trend toward more machine vision and melt-based technologies. Um, and that that is a good point though, that, that the small farms 
maybe the wearables fit better because it's a variable cost model, whereas the, the other systems are more fixed cost systems. So um, that may be where we see more of the machine vision and, and melt-based technologies on large farms, but more of the wearables on small farms. Thank you, Jeff. And the last question is, how do you properly evaluate accuracy of the data collected from different technologies? How reliable they are so you can actually make decisions based on them? Um, maybe I didn't understand, but it's how they communicate with each other and how can you make decisions based on them, like all the data that are coming in? Well, that's a whole, that's a whole uh, lecture in itself. Um, <laughs> as far as we have to have a gold standard to compare something to. So if we take something like rumination, ever we watch cows ruminate, and then um, that goes through a process. There are documents of how to do that, that set standards for how to do that so that we can determine, you know, first of all, does it measure what it's saying it's measuring? And then um, that's that's one level question. The next level question is, is does it provide useful information? So like if we're looking at disease detection, how well does it do in terms of sensitivity and specificity of detecting whatever we're we're looking for and and to me i think there's a need for more and more of those studies um, by universities by independent entities to help evaluate these technologies 